The Institute of World Affairs at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee presents International Focus, a weekly discussion of the people and events behind today's global headlines. Support provided by Milwaukee Public Television and the UWM Center for International Education. Now here's your host, Doug Savage. Welcome to International Focus. Our topic today, austerity and the public sector. As European policymakers struggle to find a cure for the continent's economic woes, dramatic public sector belt tightening has largely been the prescription of choice. Across the Atlantic and here at home, a long-standing debate has been reignited between those favoring government austerity as the economic panacea and advocates of government spending and economic stimulus. As this debate swirls in the rarefied air of European finance ministries, the street-level impact has been more immediate and more concrete. Large public sector layoffs and cuts in salary, pension, and other worker benefits have sparked protests across the Eurozone and beyond. Our guest today works on the front lines of an increasingly global conflict over public services and government spending. Teresa Marshall serves as communications coordinator for Public Services International, a global trade union federation based in France, representing 20 million public sector workers in 150 countries. Teresa, welcome to Wisconsin and International Focus. Thank you for having me here. Well, I um, wonder if we could just start with uh, a little background on just sort of the scale of some of the cuts that, uh, that people are seeing across Europe particularly. Well, we've been seeing over the last three and a half years a concerted attack on public services, on public service workers, and basically an attack on the common good um, across Europe. Uh, and we, we're also seeing that here in North America, in uh, the United States and Canada as well. Um, in, it varies from country to country. Some of the worst effects that we're seeing are certainly in places like Greece, Ireland, uh, Portugal, Spain, but also in places like Romania and Latvia. And Latvia is actually um, one of the first cases where the IMF uh, and um, European uh, Bank uh, prescription for dealing with austerity was applied. And in Latvia, real wages have been cut by almost 50 percent. We're seeing in Romania 27 percent uh, wage cuts. and. In, today, in Greece, with the uh, accumulated um, bailout package uh, prescriptions that are being applied here, we're seeing that public sector workers are experiencing real wage cuts of upwards of 25%, um, including the um, hit that they're taking on pensions and so forth. And at the same time, uh, workers across Europe are also trying to deal with um, real wage losses in terms of um, their effects on their pensions, where they're being forced to pay more uh, in contributions or uh, higher taxes, but where they're also feeling the stress now to have to work longer years, so in effect deferred wages in that area. Well, you know, before we go any further, uh, you know, you've uh, brought a little clip I think uh, we could show now about a uh, demonstration in the UK. So if we could uh, maybe take a look at that and give us some, some sense of the, the visual landscape that we're looking at. Sure. services are, are everything to the people of Great Britain. I mean, that's how our country runs as well as it does. We rely on public services and if they disappear, the most vulnerable in society will be left out there on their own. I think we've got to show that uh, ordinary people are not going to pay the price of the failure of the capitalist system caused by the banks. And that is the big struggle that's taking place in this country and right around the world. Who is going to pay for the crisis? And we've got to fight to make sure that ordinary people don't. This government can do a lot more to cut the deficit in other ways rather than literally um, 
jeopardising people's lives. Coming here today, we can show the government that we, we're not going to stand for what they're doing. The private market does not govern everything as it's supposed to do. All it cares about is profit, and as long as profit's there, it will carry on, and it will do the least possible for as much profit as possible. So that's why public services are important, and the state has to run that. with adults with learning disabilities will lose some of their day centres where they meet, where they make friends. They have very few opportunities to go and meet people, to make friends with people. What happens when they've gone? They'll be at home, they'll be isolated. The psychological damage to those people will be great. And that will happen with elderly people too. And that's my real worry. We are campaigning for quality public services, not alone, but together with a coalition of all the global union federations, public and private sector workers who says, this is the time where we want to see investment in the quality public services so that we can ensure that our children will get good education, that there is a social health care system that will take care of us, that there is an elder care system that will take care of our parents, and that we can get to work with the public transportation that is well functioning. So this is about quality public services action now. Well, it's, it's striking in a number of ways. One, one is uh, the, the resemblance to what was going on here about a year ago in Wisconsin. But uh, one thing that, that struck me is the message was very much uh, about public services rather than just equity for public workers. Now, I think that, that is a little bit different than some of what we've heard here. Well, I, the message that I'm hearing here uh, in Wisconsin in just the few days that I've been on the ground here is, I think, actually remarkably congruent that the it's about reclaiming Wisconsin for the, the common good, that uh, public service workers work in the people's interest. And public service workers generally have very high um, values about the professionalism, the, uh, the pride that they take in delivering services that the community depends on, but our families depend on equally. And it's interesting that um, uh, we are now engaging in a uh, wider outreach um, among uh, a wider community where private sector workers are also recognizing and endorsing the value of access to quality public services, understanding that unless we have access to affordable health care, for our family, for elder care, for our, our uh, parents, uh, for education, for our children, that we all lose and that in fact it is about reclaiming the common good for all of us. It's not simply um, the interests of, uh, you know, one part of the workforce, but in fact public services um, is about uh, equitable redistribution of the wealth for the common good of all. And uh, talk a little bit about in in most European settings, the, the role the public sector plays just as a, a portion of the economy. Well, certainly a sizable portion of uh, economies. Uh, again, it varies from country to country, but you will find that in um, Scandinavian countries, in uh, France, Germany, uh, the UK, for sure, um, it's a really um, significant part of the economies. And in fact, we know that looking worldwide, that public services support more than half of all jobs and two thirds of those actually being in the private sector. So um, there's no question that public services are essential to healthy economies, but they're as equally uh, important to healthy communities. And, and what is that connection between the, the private sector and public sector you just referenced? Um, in terms of the, well, the public funding supports private jobs. If we don't have good education, if we don't have good roads, if we don't have good uh, railway systems, we don't have good legal systems that corporations and businesses can rely on um, to uh, operate their businesses, to have the trained, skilled workers that they need um, to do their business, and if we don't have good public services providing those, 
the private sector is not able to function in the way that we know it today in the world. So in fact, um, the private sector, although it doesn't always acknowledge um, how dependent it is on uh, you know, the public services and the work that public service workers do, it's essential, it's vital. And, and we also see it in terms of uh, stability. Um, where we have functioning public services, we generally see more peaceful, more democratic, uh, more stable societies. And that's where corporations would rather do business because they're, it's, it's a reliable uh, political situation and they know that their business won't be you know, threatened by um, uh, war, civil war breaking out immediately or the whims of a, a dictator in that area. And for the, the general public, do you think in European societies, and I'm thinking, for example, of the UK, is there a different expectation of the level of public service than perhaps there is in North America? I mean, I'm thinking of you know, the, the National Health Service or things like that. Even very conservative British governments have not really proposed in any serious way dismantling the, the National Health Service. I mean, is there a fundamental difference in, in the perception of what public services one might expect? Um, there's definitely different cultural uh, differences uh, depending on what country you're, you're operating in. Um, I come from Canada and so certainly the expectation of uh, access to affordable quality health care as a right is something that citizens in Canada uh, believe in very strongly. Similarly for education um, and the right to water. It's interesting that um, our public service uh, union has worked with many um, allies around the world in recent years around the issue of uh, access to uh, water and sanitation as a human right. And that was just recognized in the last year by the United Nations. So now that we actually have um, recognition, UN recognition of the right to access um, water and sanitation is a human right. I mean, it's uh, it's very fundamental. And so the um, conception of um, access to child care, public child care as a right um, is certainly something that many um, citizens are viewing as, uh, you know, something that they're expecting. So we've uh, not got a great deal of time before our break, but one of the things uh, that is put forward as, as a response to criticism of the austerity plans is just there's simply not enough money and we have to cut somewhere. What, what is, what's the alternative to taking out of the hide of the public sector, if you will? Well, first of all, I think it's important to uh, note that it wasn't working people. It's not working people who've caused the crisis. And so it shouldn't be working people who pay the price for the uh, mistakes and often illegal activities of uh, financiers and the financial class. Um, they must be held accountable. They must start paying their fair, ch their fair share. And as well, we need to make sure that the, the wealthy 1% are paying their fair share. Right now, um, if in America the, um, the wealthy were taxed 1% more, it would wipe out the deficit of all the states, of every individual state. So I think it's important that we look at how the burden is being uh, imposed and how it's being shared. Um, it's important that we look at mechanisms such as a financial transactions tax that will take a small, tiny uh, percentage from the speculative activity that has fueled this kind of a crisis and use it to uh, pay back into the common good, into funding public services that will provide the stability uh, and the foundation for decent jobs that our communities depend on. Okay, well, we'll uh, come back and talk a little bit more about the comparisons between uh, the, the public sectors elsewhere and in North America. Right now, we'll take a short break. We'll be back with more International Focus. The Institute of World Affairs presents our community with a range of public programs relating to global issues, U.S. foreign policy, and the world economy. For more information about the Institute of World Affairs, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website at www.iwa.uwm.edu. Welcome back. We're talking with Theresa Marshall about uh, austerity and the public sector. 
Well, let's uh, turn our attention a little more to North America. One thing that's striking, particularly here in Wisconsin, is uh, much of the, the pushback against things like the, some of the protests we saw in Madison was basically it's perceived as, well, here are public sector workers who are perhaps overpaid to begin with, and they don't like having to uh, foot the bill the way the private sector does. So is, is this... Well, that's a fallacy to start with. Um, if you look at the re most, even the most recent studies that compare the relative um, value of a public sector uh, worker's uh, salary income to private sector uh, workers in comparable fields, we find that uh, public sector workers are generally paid uh, on or below par to what is equivalent in, in the private sector. And what's also not factored into that is, again, the public service that is provided, uh, providing the services in our communities that um, help sustain us, as well as the uh, tax dollars that our, our members are paying into uh, our, our economies that support um, the common good in that, in that way. So I think that what we need to, d to deal with today is the issue of um, are we all going to be uh, driven down to the lowest common denominator or are we going to make the choice that we all need to be raised up to a more uh, equitable level, sustainable level, and that it's not about, um, uh, you know, the standard of having a, a pension is some kind of golden benchmark that shouldn't be attainable by all of us. It's something that we should all be striving for and that we all um, really need to make sure that we're, um, we're, we're cared for um, through our lives. Well, are we uh, just seeing a more advanced part of a, a process in which there was at one time more parity between those kinds of benefits for private sector workers and public sector workers, was there not? Um, there have been times, and again, it depends on the, the countries that you're, you're looking at. Um, I think that it, it's really important that we talk about a larger vision um, than just wages. That in fact, what we should be striving for is uh, a larger package that protects all of us. And that uh, is something that um, will be uh, in the area of a social protection floor. Something that provides a minimum guarantee of support to all citizens. So that we have a minimum wages, that we uh, ensure that pensions are delivered to all um, citizens, uh, that people are looked after in terms of having access to affordable health care, affordable education, and services that support them through their lives. And that if we look at having a minimum social protection floor, that we're all raised up. And that, that, that will advance our um, communities more than worrying about um, you know, private sector making more uh, or less than, than public workers. I think that we need to be talking about a, a larger vision. And how does that happen? So that the, the basis for that is fair taxation. We have to talk about um, people paying their fair share. And right now, working people in America are more than paying their fair share. So we need to, go, again, go back and um, look at why uh, tax cuts are being imposed on the wealthiest in our society and why then we, as working people, are being asked to pay more. That isn't fair. That's fundamentally inequitable. So we need to talk about fair taxation on corporations and fair taxations on wealthy individuals uh, in our societies. And what, uh, what role does organized labor and union density play in all of this? Well, I think that it's clear that the um, forces who um, are interested in cutting taxes, who are interested in cutting um, labor rights for working people, are um, cognizant of the fact that if there is uh, a weakened voice for working people, that it will be easier to drive through initiatives such as privatization of public services that are for corporate benefit, but not for the benefit of the common good. And so it's very important that people have the rights to represent themselves in their workplaces so that they have um, input, democratic input, into the delivery of their work for the benefit of all. And, uh, and what are some of the, the basic numbers in terms of, of just union density, people in unions 
in some of the places you work versus North America? Okay. Well, in places like Scandinavia, union density can be as high as 85 to 90 percent. So it's um, a strong culture that was won through um, some very significant struggles by the working people in those countries uh, earlier in the, um, the 20th century. And recognizing that if they didn't, uh, if they weren't able to organize and uh, speak um, as workers in, in delivering services and determining their working conditions in their workplace, that they would not be um, equally contributing uh, members of their society. So it's a very high union density in the Scandinavian countries, for, sh for, uh, for example. In places like France, it's actually much lower, um, you know, in the neighborhood of 8 to 9 percent union density. However, the um, uh, effectiveness of unions in raising their voices has developed in uh, a very strong way, and so unions actually um, are very uh, capable of putting forward their demands um, in the public uh, arena there. Um, but to come back to, to North America and Canada, um, we have an average of uh, union density of uh, 32 to 38 percent across Canada, depending on which uh, province you're in. So it's still a quite, quite a strong union density there. This is public and private sector? That's correct, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, both on that front. So uh, one thing that I think is a relatively new development, although uh, you know people have been talking about it for a long time, is uh, the sense of coordination across boundaries to the extent that it mm -hmm. seems to be happening today. I mean, is this a relatively new phenomenon? Yes and no. I, I think that um, it's a reflection of globalization. Um, Corporations are already, uh, you know, functioning very strongly across borders, um, and they're functioning in a way that benefits themselves in terms of making sure that there are um, uh, taxes that are favorable to their op or tax levels that are favorable to their bottom line wherever they go, uh, in influencing international free trade agreements across borders. Uh, and so it's imperative that working people and uh, citizens in uh, around the world be abreast of that kind of impact of globalization and find ways to work together to address the negative impacts of that. I mean, one of the key issues that we're um, uh, seeing today that we're, we're going to have to grapple with is the rising level of uh, precarious work and the rising numbers of migrant workers who, because of uh, austerity cuts in their countries, uh, or because of war or internal strife, are being displaced and having to force, or having to um, seek work uh, outside of their, uh, their own borders. And so that um, workforce creates pressures for us in our, you know, within our national borders um, on the levels of, of um, employment or wages that, that can be offered. And certainly, um, under the globalization, corporations can, manip can manipulate, um, you know, that kind of usage of migrant workforces across borders to drive down um, working conditions and wages. And so. Those are the kinds of issues that we need to deal with. And we also need to talk about developing a, a larger vision in terms of what do we believe in as civil society? Uh, do we see as a global vision where we can um, ensure that we have equitable, just, and democratic societies? And we're no longer actors um, alone. We, we must uh, work together across borders to achieve a better uh, vision for, for our world. Well, and talk a little bit about how your organization is doing that. So Public Services International is a global union federation, and uh, as you uh, noted earlier, we represent 20 million members in upwards of 150 countries around the world. So people who deliver um, health care, who uh, you know, put out fires, um, who keep our streets clean, who make sure that the water is clean and fresh when we turn on our taps, who take care of our children in uh, kindergarten, and so forth. Um, we are working um, across our 
affiliates across our borders to try and support each other in um, trying to find solutions to many of the challenges that we're facing today that are common so that uh, in the UK uh, where we're experiencing attacks on members um, uh, working rights but also where our citizens are seeing the loss of services and health care and the privatization of water delivery transit transit um, systems and so forth we can um, draw links between the uh, some of the common players who are driving those um, uh, those changes, so that we know that in uh, you know here in uh, Wisconsin that the multinational corporation Veolia, uh, who is driving uh, privatization of water services on a uh, municipal or a state level, is the very same uh, company that we're dealing with in France, and where municipalities such as Paris um, have a effectively fought back against uh, water privatization or actually in Paris's situation, um, they experienced that uh, the privatization of water services increased uh, fees to consumers and to the, the city uh, by upwards of 20% uh, or more in different areas. And so they've reclaimed their uh, public ownership over those previously privatized water services. So we can share lessons, we can share inspiration across borders about how to, um, to build a more just society. Great. Well, we'll have to leave it at that. Teresa Marshall, thank you for joining us. To our viewers, see you next time on International Focus. For information about the Institute of World Affairs and its many programs, or to become a member of the Institute, call 414-229-3220 or visit our website.